Hello and welcome to Heavy Metal Rex. My name is Oase, and I want to thank you for joining me for episode four of Tuner Talk. I cannot believe that we are already on episode four. I originally did not know how this ser series was even going to go, but I am thankful that so many people have found this series useful, whether you are somebody who has just bought a WRX of any model or any year, or even somebody who's thinking about getting into uh, Subaru, a lot of this information is cross-generational, which I think is fantastic. Uh, look, I know you saw the thumbnail. Trust me, I am just as excited uh, as you are for our next guest for this Tuner Talk. And you know what? I'm just going to stop talking, and let's get right into it. Tanner, thank you so much for joining me on this, uh, this episode of Tuner Talk. I know that you are not exactly a tuner, but I think out of everybody that I've known on the internet, if there's somebody who is next to a tuner, I believe that it is you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done a little bit of tuning here and there with like Haltech and a little bit of like Cobb, a couple, like before the green speed stuff, but yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, I I will say that I'm I'm as excited as everybody else is because I've been a fan for a, a considerable amount of time. Uh, before I purchased my 2021 WRX, uh, of course, your videos were very inspirational to me because I was worried about uh, buying a thirty thousand dollar car and blowing it up. I watched a couple other channels, and and really, you know that that was the catalyst for me to finally be able to jump in because I mean I've wanted one my whole life, and when I finally I never really thought about what it is what it would mean to even own one until mm -hmm. I started watching videos on the internet and started talking to people in my community about it. Um, so th with that in mind, I wanted to, I have a list of questions I want to ask you. Some, some about you, some about uh, some technical stuff, but um, a lot of these are, I, I'm curious, you know, I'm sure people are curious. Um, so I wanted to know what is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. First, please, <laughs> for those of you in the channel who don't know, who Tanner is or who Smedia is, please, can you just give us a quick synopsis? Yeah, so uh, my name is Tanner Smith. I run the YouTube channel Smedia. Um, it's primarily Subaru stuff. Every time I try to dabble outside of Subaru stuff, people get mad at me, so I keep doing the Subaru stuff for right now. Eventually, that'll trickle out, and it'll, it'll always be Subaru-related, but uh, for the most part, over the past, what, two and a half, three years, it's all been Subaru stuff, building on, talking, like, discussion topic videos of reliability, modifications to do, not to do, um, how to build the cars, how not to build the cars, like, all, all this other stuff. Um, so, yeah, just all, literally everything encompass, encompassing Subaru right now is pretty much what we do over on the channel, building the 04 STI, uh, building my 17 STI, the 14 hatchback that we just wrapped up. So, I mean, all, all sorts of stuff all the time. I, I will say, out of anybody, you were way deserving for hitting that 100,000 subs. And I cannot believe how long it took because I, I was watching when before you were, and I was like, man, how the hell? Oh, I got a hundred thousand. And this, this was like around, I want to say like November last yeah. year. I think, no, I think November at the end of November, early December is when we hit a hundred thousand. But I mean, that's one thing that a lot of people brought up and it's one thing that I, cause I mean, I, in theory, I could have done it way sooner if we wanted to, but I tried to, I don't like clickbaity titles. I don't like doing all the watch this video. And then it's like a two minutes, maybe a 30 second segment of what i mentioned in the title. So I've always steered clear of those because obviously, I mean, if anyone wants to do it, I mean, they could just be like blowing up my Subaru in 10 minutes or something like that. And it's just a, a clickbait, whole clickbaity thing. And I just, I like the videos to stay true to what the content is. So, I mean, for me, it's no rush. I mean, it's, uh, it's a number in my opinion. I don't really care how big the channel is as long as the videos either help people, they're getting entertainment or information from them. That's personally all I really care about. Like, it's cool to have a plaque and everything, but it's, that's not real, like a real motivating factor for me. Yeah, I'd say the helping helping people is what happens. I mean, they're entertaining, but I think I will be honest. If I'm looking for something, or when I was looking for something for my 21, usually mm -hmm. that's your channel is where I started. And if I couldn't find it there, then I would go to Reddit because I Reddit sometimes ends up being a lot more than I'm ready to handle. But you're I'm like, okay, it's, oh, yeah. it's here. I can see it. This is this is perfect. So. Uh, thanks so much. I wanted to start with what is your favorite Subaru model so far? We've got tons of them. So many to like pick ever? from. Yeah, probably ever. I mean, I could play it safe and go with an Impreza model. If I'm going safe and I'm going Impreza model, I'm say the 0405. I really mm -hmm. love the blob eyes, the, the GDs. 
I've had, I've owned every generation of WRX and STI at this point. I've owned some Foresters, uh, except for the VB. I haven't owned a VB. That's the one exclusion to that just because it's so recent. Um, but the 0405, it has such a, a raw feeling. It's still driver connected. You can still make them modern enough to where they're comfortable as a daily driver or a track car or a fun car. Um, if we're going outside of the spectrum of playing it safe with just Imprezas, I would say the old XT coupes the wedges as some people call them that was my first car was a 1988 wow. xt6 i absolutely love those things if i could ever get an opportunity to buy one that wasn't just rusted to all hell i'd get one in a heartbeat again wow that is that's i think sometimes especially like the subi bros sometimes they forget that subaru has so many interesting models mm -hmm. than just like the impreza you know because mm -hmm. i mean my first experience was the impreza but after the little bit after that um that's i had seen foresters uh, yeah. around like a late 2000s and i was like wow that's actually pretty cool because like i played a lot of tokyo extreme racer <laughs> on ps2 mm -hmm. and there was a lot of those i was like i know what the impress is but what is this box like yeah. this is what is this toaster box but it looks awesome <laughs> and even now in my super community most of us if we see a forester from like late 2000s we will just stop looking at everything else and just yeah. focus on that because it's just going to the toaster. Yeah, I dude, a slam, not even slam toe, but just like a lower toaster. Oh my! They God. look good. They look great. They look oh. good. They can be fast. They're fun. They're usable. That's you know, at my age, that's all I want. Something that just hits all those numbers. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that you you went unsafe with that because I think that if normally when somebody's asked that question, the mind goes to some sort of Impreza or some sort of WRX or SCI within the lab. Yeah. Or I'd say between 2002 and 2014 for the most part. If um, no one knows what a XT looks like, and I'm not talking about like a Forcer XT, like a, a Subaru XT, go Google one. They're the weirdest looking cars you'll ever see. The steering wheel, everything, it's all like digital dash and all the fun. Dude, they're crazy. No, you know what? I actually have not seen the inside of it. Now I'm actually going to go look that up myself. They're um, I've seen them on the outside. Yeah, the inside, they have a like a digital dash. They've got a button on the stick shift. They've got like crazy. Dude, they're weird. The automatic seat belts like the 80s have. They're fun. Oh, the, like the one where you clip it and it moves? Yep. <laughs> it's got a lap belt that you click and then the other one's automated that goes over your shoulder. That's so funny. Yeah, I mean like uh, the, the SVX had that. And I mean a lot of a lot of 90s. My dad's uh, my dad had a Cadillac in the 90s. His yeah. Cadillac definitely had that. Um, okay, you mentioned VBs. You haven't owned one. We know that. But have you driven one yet? No. No. I haven't had an opportunity to drive one. Oh, man. That's that. I was going to ask you if you had. And it's, like, and it's funny because I just went down to Subaru this morning to go pick up some coolant and some like hoses and whatnot. And they legit have like 20 of them out on the lot for sale. Really? They have so many of them. That's so weird because like I've been hearing that like certain states not having it. But like here in St. Louis, for the most part, they sell. Dude, they, yeah. yeah, that's all they have up here. And the, well, I'm not going to say they sell up here because the same ones have been there for a while. Okay. They, ha they have a lot of them, and they have been there for a little while. But in, in the car's defense, they keep buying them in all the worst colors. <laughs> and what colors would that be? I, I hate the orange. I cannot <laughs> stand the orange, and they have so many orange ones on that lot. <laughs> wow, that's so funny. But I'm, just, I'm not about the orange. I just don't like it. That's so that is it looks like a pumpkin. It does, but I mean, you know, did you like the cross when it came out in orange? No. <laughs> I didn't even like the GRWRX and STI when they came out in that orange. I've always hated that orange. That's so funny. Because I it hear looks like it's a always crayon. silver. It does. It does. But I mean I'll be honest, I kinda like it. <laughs> that's, that's all right. It's a, it, not everyone's taste. Not yeah. everyone has to like it. That's right. that's the thing. We get we get a lot of silvers. We get silvers and blues for some reason. Every single one. Uh, just now, another another dealership in St. Louis just posted on Reddit like, "Hey, we just got we're getting new ones here in like a week. They're all silver and blue, all of them." Yeah, I don't know why, but we because I, I know in Texas, they're 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 everywhere. They can't mm -hmm. sell them in Texas, but I mean that makes sense. Texas, right? There's we don't really need all wheel drive, so people don't buy them. Same thing with Florida. Yes. You know, there's tons and tons. My cousin, she bought one over in Florida, and she tells me all the time how there's just every time they drive by a Subaru dealership, they're loaded. But up here, yep. we can't even. There's usually when they get them, they sell them unless unless it's a GT. GTs they sit on the lot for a while. GTs are top trim, automatic, all that fun stuff. Yeah, right? with the Recaros and the electronic dampers. But I don't they should have just made it a manual. They sh 
<laughs> they should have. So, um, well, that now I was I was really curious. I I was hoping you had driven one, but man, I because I wanted to know your thoughts. It is completely different. I'm sure you probably heard this from people. You know that having bought like the last 2021 in 2020, mm -hmm. like December 2021 is when I got mine, and they were like, "Oh yeah, this they're not shipping any more of these." I think maybe there was one more batch coming in in like January, but that was it. There was yeah. no, they weren't making any more. And after having driven VB, I came back and I drove my 21, and I legit felt like I'm driving a car from 1998. Like See, it I've, felt that much. So I've owned four FA20 WRXs before I started doing YouTube, and I couldn't couldn't keep them more than six months. I mm -hmm. I just never liked the car enough, and I tried multiple times, and every time it'd be six months or under, I'd sell it. I had my 2022 BRZ with the FA24, and that was a, the naturally aspirated FA24 and that BRZ was a, in my opinion, a big improvement over even the turbocharged FA20 and the WRXs because it felt way more responsive. I will give it that. Mm -hmm. But I have not had the opportunity to drive the new VV yet. See, now, now we, when you do, you have got to let me know because I, that's what I was really curious about because it is, and especially now what you've said about the FA20, you were, mm -hmm. I feel like, I would put money on it that your mind will be blown because I think out of all the Subarus I've ever driven, I used to sell Subarus in 2007. Actually, I used to sell Blob Eyes. Um, <laughs> and uh, every Subaru I've driven since then and now, this has been like the best, and I don't even mean the best WRX. It's like the best Subaru car that I have ever driven. It seems like they learned nothing for 10, 20 years, and then all of a sudden somebody came in and said, change all of it. And they did. Like, the tune is great. The drive is great. The st people complain about the steering, but, like, it is really good. Like, the car, I haven't gotten a chance to take it on the track, which I will this this year. Um, I yeah. took my FA, my, my VA out there, and it was, I thought it was great until I drove this thing. Um, but I, I look forward to it. I look forward to you go driving it because I, I want to, everybody wants to hear your impressions of it. But I, I think that you're going to be thoroughly surprised. Um, we'll see. I can be picky. <laughs> Again, just knowing what you said right now about the FA20 and the VA, that yeah. experience and all of – since you've owned that many, as soon as you drive one, everything you hated, you will see an, a direct answer for in that car. And that's, I think that's the difference. If I get the opportunity to drive one, I'll follow up. All right. Perfect. So that – you you know – I was on the. I did watch this. I didn't catch the live stream when you did it the other night. Yeah. And uh, while I, while and when I saw it pop up, I was actually recording a film. I was like, oh, I can't. I want to watch this, but I can't be on it. Uh, but I did go back and listen to it. And people did ask you, like you said, mm -hmm. or that people want to know all the time, when are you going to build one? Are you going to build one? Um, so let's. So we'll we'll wait. We're going to wait till you drive one, and then we'll ask that question again. So now I wanted to know, you you build all these cars, and they mm -hmm. look awesome. But have you had a chance to take any of them out on like a track day? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. So living in Washington state, this is the crappy thing about being up here is everyone says, oh, it looks so beautiful. The scenery is nice, but it rains all the time. And you're not wrong. It does rain all the time. Um, there's been a couple track days I have been able to get out to. There have been some that I've tried to get out to specifically with cars like that people wanted me to see like on the track, like my 05 STI after I got them building that one. I was scheduled for like three or four drag racing events in that car. And every single time the day prior, they'd be like, all right, there's a weather notice for the track. Oh. I'd be like, okay, don't cancel the next following morning. And I'd look, be like canceled, rained out, canceled, missed, canceled, track wet, all this stuff. So it's not unless it's like the dead of summer mm -hmm. when we can really go out there. So a lot of the times what we do is we'll go deep up into the mountains and we'll go drive up in the mountains because that's really the only place that we can go. It's not like they're going to shut down the mountain. Yeah. So a lot of the times we go up to the mountains, we do a lot of like mountain back road driving just because mm -hmm. they're, they're curvy. The roads are nice. There's low, low, low traffic of people up there and it's just open road for miles upon miles. So normally if we're going out to go play plus tracks over here can get expensive sometimes if it's not like the drag strip, like the drag strips, like 40 bucks. But if you go to like the Ridge Motorsports Park, you're looking at a couple hundred dollars in that day alone yeah. for consumables track time um sometimes you have to have an instructor with you so you're paying a little bit more for the track fee to even get in there um food fuel all this other stuff so i mean financially for us it's a little bit 
easier just to go out to the mountains because we can go out there whenever we want versus potentially going out to a track day. It may be rained out. It may cost six, $700 for that day. Wow. Um, there's been a couple of times we've been able to make it out there, but uh-huh. it all depends. That's, that is pretty expensive. Cause like our, even that drag racing that you mentioned, we have midnight madness, which is starting up here in April at our racetrack, which is again, I'm so thankful. I live in a place that there is a racetrack. First of all, yeah, it's like 25 bucks. Oh, like 25. It's not bucks bad. Yeah. Night. I think drag racing over here is between like 40 and $50 and you may get, three or four passes if you're lucky yeah that's i think that's the bigger issue they run it from six to midnight but so many people show up because i mean everybody's you know safe drag racing yeah that's where you do it um and track day that's also real expensive like six seven hundred bucks i my first track day last year that i did i had no concept on what to do what to bring nobody i didn't talk to anybody i get there i didn't bring gas Mm -hmm. i didn't bring a chair i didn't bring a tent i didn't bring food and i was like watching everybody else i'm like this i got there right on time i didn't even get there early i thought it said eight so i showed up at eight it was already full and so everyone's already set up with their tents their coolers they got spare tires and everything out i didn't even know you were supposed to do that like i still had the baby neither did i the first time i went because well i used so when i was in the army i lived down in louisiana i was in the smack dab in the middle of louisiana and we used to go down to uh, Lake Charles all the time and we would do SCCA autocross events almost every single weekend and the first time I went down there I had no idea I was like because I saw everyone has like these pop up tents they have like stools benches chairs tools all this other stuff and I just show up there with my car I'm like I guess I'm standing out in the 90 degree sun over here while I'm not out on the track dude that is what you just described was 100% my experience because there, so yeah. we have paddocks that if you got there they're free if you get mm-hmm. there on time. So as soon as I got there, they were already full. I didn't even know that was the case. And yeah. then the person next to me had a tent finally. And the entire time I just stood in the sun and I had to wait until like five o'clock. People started leaving. Then I was able to pull my car. But that time, at that time, there was only an hour left and I was already dead. And yeah. I made a video. Standing in the sun day. all day just wears you out. But then you're also driving in the sun. We had to have yep. our windows open. So no air conditioning and hot air just slapping you in the face, helmet on. And the video I made for it was really funny because I laugh at when I go back and watch like my enthusiasm and the glow on my face when I'm leaving in the morning goes down during the day. And then like when I got home, I just looked like I just ran a marathon. Like I just was so tired and I was like, yeah, guys, this was fun. I can't wait to do it (laughs) next time. And I was like, wow, it is, it, it is grueling. You know, it is something that I have never really done before. So I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, All right. So on the channel, you've built just, Tons and tons of cars. I know what my favorite one so far is, and it's the one you're, that you got to fix down. That's blue. I'm yeah. really excited about that. What has been your favorite build on the channel so far? I would say blue. Yeah. Just because that, that car has been a sheer learning experience for so much stuff. I've, that's the car I initially started practicing welding on when I was making my first downpipe. That's the car I learned how to do motorsports wiring on, which ultimately potentially led to one of the reasons the motor failed which was 100 um, percent my fault but it's all learning experience like this next revision of stuff i have everything that's just race spec now that won't promote failure because i tried to cheap out on stuff uh, as most of us do we're like all right where can we save a couple bucks here and there and wiring supplies do not just don't don't do it that's why i'm such a stickler with like wiring stuff even if it's like basic wiring harnesses i'm making now it's like i will not use AutoZone, O'Reilly's, any of that kind of wiring anymore, just because like the pure wiring differences between like CCA wire, and it's not going to be like a noticeable difference for what most people are doing out there for like maybe hard wiring a fuel pump or something like that. But I've just gotten in the mindset where I'm like, all right, if I'm going to do everything, I'm just going to do it the right way now. Yeah. So that car has been just a sheer learning experience of uh, I'm figuring out how to rewire an OEM system that engineers in Japan made and like, all right, how can I trick it to make X, Y, or Z things work? How can I make the DCCD work? How can I retain vehicle speed? How do I do all of this while running a standalone and a stock ECU? I had the whole situation where the whole car locked me out for like three weeks where I'm sitting there trying to jailbreak the car and I'm trying to get in touch with people at Subaru of America, which is wild because Subaru of of America, people over there started emailing me trying to help. (laughs) It was just this whole back and forth situation, but 
Um, cause like most of the EJs that, that I do, like the, the O4 STI, the 14 WRX, all that stuff. It's awesome. I love doing EJ stuff. I've been doing EJs for a long time. I didn't really get serious about doing EJs till a couple of years ago when I started doing all the videos and I was like, all right, now that I'm shooting all these videos, I'll actually start learning about this stuff a lot more. Cause if you go way back to the beginning of my channel, I had no idea how to put on, uh, an oil pan, fuel injectors, a front mount intercooler, all of these basic bolt-ons that are like a walk in the park for me now. I had no idea how to do them. So it's just been a, a progression of like learning how to do this stuff. And it's all just kind of leading up to the blue STI, which is like my white whale, I guess you could say my Moby Dick. <laughs> so I'm going through there, um, just redoing all that stuff. And I've learned a ton on that car. I'm still continuously learning more like how, uh, how to integrate can communication systems between a standalone and an OEM ECU. What features can I use from a can system? how to make relay harnesses and control things on a timed sequence or when one thing happens, something else will activate and all this other stuff. So the car is just a learning experience. Like I've been a big fan. I'm cheap. That's the biggest thing for me. And that's why I learned how to do everything myself is I'm cheap. I will not pay someone else if I can figure out how to do it myself, which has been the causation of everything of learning how to wire, learning how to weld, fabricate, all this other stuff, build motors, like all this other stuff. It's just I'm, I don't want to pay someone. Like I'm sure... For most people, if they have the extra funds, I totally get it. Like building a car, the parts cost isn't really the biggest contributing factor for building mm -hmm. carts. Paying a shop labor, that adds up because you're looking oh, at yeah. like on average like $150, $160 an hour for their time. That adds up so quick. And then if something so, goes wrong, then it, then you now they've got to fix it. Now you got to pay because yeah. I the one thing that you just said, like I know the people that watch my channel are. Very aware. I am also a very cheap brother from down under. <laughs> I, I try so hard, like not so much to just buy cheap parts, but like where can I save the money so I can – I'm still going to use it, but can yeah. I just use it somewhere else instead of spending it on this? Now, I'm super blessed that one of my one of my best friends here, his best friend is a mechanic down the street. And so I when I tried to do my J-pipe on my WRX two years ago or last year, it – Dude, I spent six hours underneath that car, so much so, I didn't know this, that apparently I have vertigo. <laughs> oh. I didn't even know that until I laid down under the car for five hours, and then I got and everything and I like, just Yeah, and I didn't even know that. So, like, not only was I not able to get the stupid J-pipe off, because I got two studs off, and one I couldn't get off, so that I had to put it are... back together. Then now, then that same night, I laid in bed and I had my eyes closed and I turned over and all of a sudden now I'm like falling down. I'm like, what the hell yep. is going on with me? So I know I, and that's one of the reasons why I love your channel as well is because it's like, I understand that if I can try to do it, I'm going to do it. Now, there's a lot of things about cars that I have no idea and I, and I'll go look and sometimes it, it does intimidate me, you know, especially as cars get newer. Cause when I had my RX-8, I did stuff on it because it was it was fairly easy. There wasn't a whole lot in the engine bay. Yeah. I could see it. I can figure it out. But then any car after that, I was like, oh, God, a lot of cables, <laughs> you know. And I work in IT, so for me to be to be scared of cables, it's a weird thing, you know. When I look at when I'm yeah. at work or for the last twenty years, I'll be like, okay, yeah, we can do this, no problem. And everybody's like, what? What are you looking at? But so I, I understand from the other side the intimidation factor, but also the cheapness factor. And I want to say, I don't think it's cheap. It's value oriented, right? I think that's what it is. Sometimes that's I don't, what, I mean, that's like, one, one way of calling it <laughs> because I don't want to just buy the cheapest thing, right? What is the best thing that I can get for like, there's that scale, like how cheap something is versus how are you talking about for parts right now for, I'd say most things, but yeah, I want to say probably for parts. Yeah, for, I mean, for for parts, I, I don't normally cheap out on stuff. I'm just talking about on the labor side of things. Oh, okay. I just, it's paying somebody else money to do something mm. that I could. Oh, I yeah, yeah, and that you're comfortable with learning because you. Well, said... the the way I've always looked at things, and people have asked me this in the past, they're like, "How do you just go into an engine and start doing all the stuff, and you're not afraid to break anything?" I'm like, "Well, it's regardless of the fact, it's a it's a car, it's a machine, it's put together with parts. So worst mm. case scenario is you break a part." the whole car is not totaled because you broke right. apart. You can just get a replacement one and learn how to put that back on at this point. <laughs> so it's like, even if you accidentally like nick a coolant hose or an oil line or something, it's like, it's not the end of the world. There's mm -hmm. replacement parts for all of these things. So at the end of the day, it's still a machine. If you mess something up, it's repairable. You can fix it. But now, okay. But now you have to remember some of us 
will keep messing things up until now we have bought a new entire new car <laughs> and they got to figure out how to put that together. But you're absolutely right. You know, when, when, even sometimes when I'm watching your video and you're like, oh, we're just going to do this, I get anxiety looking at all of the things that need to come off and then yeah. somehow remember to put those exact things right back where you got them from because I mm -hmm. can take anything apart. Anything oh, yeah, all. you can take it apart, but put it back together or something else. <laughs> That's the trick. Yeah, because when I was a kid, I, I remember I had so many um, electronic, like radio control cars that I would take apart to see how they work. And then oh, yeah. my parents would be like, well, where's that car that we got you for? It's in pieces uh, around. Yeah, I don't want to play with it today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm glad that you talked about the, the when you said that you started doing the EJs, because that's, that's something I wanted to talk to you about was. You know, I, we've seen your reliability videos, which are very good. And I think a lot of those things do apply to the VB as well. But how have you felt over all the engines you've built, let's say stockish engines, has, what has been your perception of reliability between the EJs and the FAs? There's, so I've said this before, and it'll make some people mad when I say it. Reliability issues with EJs are 95% the owner and not the engine. Same thing can be said about V VAs and VBs, I guess you could say for the most part mm -hmm. also, with the exception, obviously no engine is perfect. And there mm -hmm. are OEM discrepancies with each engine, like obviously EJs, for example, the oil pickups, they're brazed and not welded. So we should have fixed that from the factory. It's an easy fix. If you crack an oil pickup, it's not the owner's fault. That one's a manufacturing defect because we all know that brazed oil pickups will crack over time. But for the majority of the time, and this can be FA20, FA24, EJ25, EJ207, EJ205, it doesn't matter. EJ207 will probably be a little bit more tolerant of it, but Subaru, Subarus can be picky, and we know this. Like, you can't just throw on an intake, a uh, downpipe, fuel injectors, all this stuff, and not tune the car for it. I mean, for the most part, that's with any car out there. You can't just start throwing parts at a car. Some cars are a little bit better with ECM learning than Subarus are. Like when I had my Golf R, it was OEM speed density. It didn't have a math sensor. So yeah, you could put an intake on it. You could do X, Y, or Z things. And it's not really going to throw off the tune of the car. Subarus are still math-based. So that that intake reading, the fuel trims, all of that stuff, they get temperamental quick. Plus the other thing is big with older EJs. You can't really say it too much about FA20s yet, but you probably will be in, in a couple of years is a lot of like GD chassis and GR chassis EJs at this point are so old and they have so many miles on them that when a new owner goes to buy one because they want one, A, they don't know a lot about the car, so they don't know what to look out for. B, it probably has unknown maintenance history, so they have absolutely no idea what's been going on with the car. C, they want to modify it. They want it to sound like a Subaru. They want it to go fast. They want an access port. And instead of taking the time to do the necessary maintenance items, get the car up to date, make sure that everything is solid before you start modifying it. That's going to lead to more engine issues because you're trying to push more performance out of the car while it still has X, Y, or Z problems, whether it's like a valve cover gasket leak, downpipe leaking, a clogged fuel injector, a sticking injector, X, Y, or Z things that people get these bad experiences with them. And that like most older cars at this point can be most older turbo cars, I guess you should say naturally aspirated cars are a little bit more tolerant with things that you do to them because you're not making 20 PSI, even if it is on mm -hmm. a stock turbo or a smaller turbo, that's going to be putting more stress on the engine. But it's just like with, with those older ones, it's all, that's a big reason why people have bad experiences with EJs at this point, because they're, they've obviously been around a lot longer than FAs have. Yeah. So the yeah. FAs, the FAs, I guarantee will get there to that same point. But right now it's just the EJ terms of people dealing with those plus people not knowing how to build them. Because I've said this before, I don't like saying there's a right or wrong way to build a car. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the at the end of the day, there is a right and wrong way to to put one of these together. Yeah, and uh, what you said about uh, FA is getting to that point. I mean, we're almost there, right? Twenty fourteen yeah. is when the it first came one came out. out. They're almost ten years. I'd say at like the fifteen year mark, that's when things are going to start. They're going to start doing the same thing. Or even like, because I mean, I live on Reddit, and that's where I see it the mm -hmm. most. Where you know somebody will post, uh, "Hey, thinking about buying this, you know, 2015, 2016, 89,000 miles," and there's they'll show the engine bay and there's like, you could tell something happened there. Like yeah. it's returned to stock, it's been sold or whatever. And I think at the end of the day, I, you can say Subarus, but like you said, like most cars, it still always ends up coming back to taking care of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there's, there's people even now that have cars that are tuned way beyond, I feel like what, or what most tuners would say is the capacity for that block. They've been running it for one, two, three years, but because they are real 
religiously taking care of it, you know, doing yeah. all this, you know, whatever maintenance, maybe early, just making sure. And this, you know, I, that was my concern as well coming into the Subaru community was like everybody was telling me, oh, well, just the same joke. Oh, well, you know, your head gasket or you know, your engine's going to blow. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that seems like a terrible purchase, you know, be yeah. buying this car. And there's a, like next day, I'm just, it's a t literally a ticking time bomb. That can't be true. Yeah. And, uh, like, like with the whole car, like any car is subject to it. Like, for example, I had, I had a Golf R. I had a Golf R for a month. My girlfriend has a GTI. They were both, they're both Mark 7. After a month, my Golf R died. It blew up. The GTI has been going strong, but like I, that goes back to me. It was my fault. I didn't take the time to go through there when I first bought the car, learn enough about it, um, do all the little maintenance items, the the timing cover, gasket, spark plugs, all that stuff. I was excited. I was like, dude, I just got this Golf R. Everyone's been hyping these things up. I was having a blast with it. It was comfortable. It was fun. And then after that month hits, and now I'm, I don't want to say, I don't hate Volkswagens, but I'm a little bit scarred by them at this point to the point where if I were to buy another Golf R or another Volkswagen, I, that's the first thing I'm going to do now is go through there and do all of that maintenance. But like that GTI that we have has given us absolutely no problems, none whatsoever. So it's, you, that's one thing that people do because it happens because people always like to compare like Subarus to Evos also, or uh -huh. SCIs to Evos. You also have to look at like manufacturing quality. Obviously more people are going to have issues with Subarus and Mitsubishis because there's a massive difference in manufacturing quantity between the two, but it's like, it, it, it's any car. It's absolutely any car out there. You just have to take the time to go through there. When you first get it, Hey, learn the platform. That's the biggest thing. I tell people, it doesn't matter what you're buying, a, a GTR, an STI, an Evo 8, an Evo 10, a GTI, a Elantra N. I don't care what the car is. Take the time to learn it. Yeah. Because that's going to be that's gonna be the biggest thing that keeps that car alive the longest. These aren't Toyota Camrys. They're not Corollas. They're not daily commuter cars. They're performance cars that we beat on. Other people, if you're buying it used, I guarantee you the last owner beat oh, on yeah. it. Even if they said they didn't, <laughs> they, they, they've seen abuse and they will continue to see abuse and neglecting maintenance or unrelated problems dude it just goes straight down the rabbit hole that's why this 04 sti that i just got even though it has uh it had a beautiful engine bay with like all quality parts put on it there's a reason i still took it out and i still went through there and refreshed everything like the mm -hmm. valve cover gaskets were leaking the oil cooler was leaking like x y and z if i just continued to drive the car one of the all the axle boots were ripped it's like if i continue to drive the car <laughs> let's say i'm a brand new owner and i just bought this thing and it's my first subaru and it's got all these problems of course i'm gonna have a bad experience with the car mm -hmm. it's got all of these problems but at the end of the day it's still a 20 it's almost a 20 year old Subaru at this point so obviously but i went down the rabbit hole in that one man i cannot even imagine being a new owner and buying that car and then not checking it that's it is destined for is destined for the junkyard then yeah. that's a lot of problems you know but it's I, like i wouldn't i wouldn't expect someone who's like super unknowledgeable to go into it and be like all right i know that i have to go fix all of these things but like that's where it takes time just learn the platform yeah that's i did that with my rx8 I, the only thing I knew about it was I saw it in the movie X-Men when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. That's it. The doors opened this way. I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy that one day. I got my college. I got out of college. I got my big boy job. First thing I did, I went to the dealer. I bought an RX-8. Yeah. Everything about it was terrible. I, I loved the car, but like, I didn't know about the gas mileage. I didn't know that it mm -hmm. had a weird, <laughs> different engine. There was so many things that I had to spend. I spent six years learning, and then we had floods in Houston, and my car literally just floated away. Oh, that's always fun. Very sad about that. Because it took me a long time to learn everything. It was like, a, I was like, wow, this is a car? That's like no other car I've ever seen in my life. It was, it was yeah. fantastic. So that EJ reliability question leads me into a somewhat of a controversial thing. And I, and I wasn't sure I wanted to talk to you about it, but I, I think I do. Because I, I talked about it a little bit. And I referenced your video in it as well. And Donut Media's High Low series, when they finally... Mm -hmm. Got WRXs. I was super excited, but what everything that you just said about reliability, I feel like applies directly to that. It can all just be said about that. And I saw somewhere I forgot who someone talked to him, and they even said that they were rushed on the production of that series, so they didn't have a lot of time to do the research. So I mean, it just goes back to doing the research and just learning the platform a little bit more. Yeah. I would say that their representation of the high low was probably an accurate representation of somebody who doesn't take the time to learn the platform and just throws parts at a car. I would say that that's probably the, the realistic owner experience for people who don't take the time to actually learn what they're An doing. older car. Cause the, the, those are small cars, right? They were. And everything that you just said about EJ and FA reliability, that was, and you're right. That is, that is, so everything about that series is 100% accurate. 
from a different point of view. Yeah. It's fantastic. I, I felt the same way too because I started watching it. I was excited uh, because I, I really liked the one they did the, the 350Zs because I love, oh man, I love Zs. I know that that was something that you had mentioned that you wanted to go back to. And I almost bought a Z before I bought the WRX. It was a 370. It was going to be a dark blue. And I was like, it's like, no, I, I love it, but I, I got to get a Subaru. As, I, as bad as it may sound, I would probably sell my my 14 WRX, the one that makes 730 horsepower. Uh-huh. I'd probably sell that for, a, for another Z car. Really, I miss these. Which I do. Year? I miss because I I originally came from Nissan's. Yeah, because my the first car I bought for myself was a 350Z when I was when I was eighteen. Had that car for like five six years. Absolutely loved it. It was burnt orange. It was the worst color. Oh they made, I, yes, I, I absolutely that. loved that thing. Uh, I had a a ninety three Skyline for a while, which pos of a car. I absolutely loved it, but the thing was such a pos. It was imported from Australia, and it was like everything was just going wrong with it. And it's so hard to get parts for those things in the states. But it's like I don't. I, I love Nissan's. I originally started playing with Nissan's, and then came over to Subarus. But it's like I, I want to go back. And that's yeah. the hard thing. And I absolutely love building all the Subarus and whatnot on YouTube. But that's the other hard thing with doing this is like when you go to buy a car. It, you're like, all right, is it a smart business decision mm-hmm. to be able to bring this car to the channel when people watch it? Is there content I can do on it? Because like, that's one of the reasons why I don't want to buy a VBWRX for right mm-hmm. now is I don't want to pay the money that dealers are asking for them. There's like you said earlier, there's not a massive modification potential for them right now outside of what people have already done. Um, I don't know if people would watch the content. Like, obviously I know there's a, a small percentage because yeah. that's the other thing is people may say that they'll watch the videos and then you actually go buy the car and you start doing the videos. And no one watches no, the videos. Just, yeah. So it's, it's that hard defining line. I, I will tell you that there, I know that there's people doing stuff on the VB, but there, there's nobody big that I've seen that has even touched it. And probably for that same thing, because when, when the reviews came out for it, it was so lukewarm that right away, even if you didn't, even if you didn't drive it, if you if you were interested, a lot of times people like to bandwagon on reviews. This happens with movies and games all the time. Yeah, that's a whole nother thing I will rant to you about because I'm a big gamer and I can't stand like <laughs> video game reviews because I think it people just don't give things a chance and that's a cheap thing. That's something you can rent and try. When it comes to cars, dude, people will just write off the whole. They'll write off the whole company <laughs> if you get yeah. one bad review. And I feel like man, they. They really did that car dirty when it came to reviews. Everybody focused on three horsepower thing. Everybody focused on how the bumper, but like there was so much. To be honest, the styling is not for me on them, but that's subjective. (laughs) And that part, yeah, that part, yeah. But we're we're gonna we're not gonna talk about it until you drive one. You you definitely will talk about it then. That's fair. All right. So now we're getting a little bit more into the technical stuff. That again, I'm really curious about this. And uh, this this is a question that's come up, and more recently, because again, we don't have a whole lot of options for the VB right now. But I think that what they're doing is they're just modifying some VA stuff uh, mm-hmm. to work on it. Is the differences between a the pros and cons between a catch can versus an AOS? The so the way that I normally go about it is a if you're on a budget, you can do a catch can way cheaper than an AOS way cheaper if you really want you can go make a catch can for 10 bucks out of some old line that you have sitting in your garage and an empty can like this easy but when if you're like looking at a quality component for each one if you want a leave it and forget it system and you don't mind spending the money in aos 100 percent of the time if it's a dedicated race car i will not run an aos on it i will run a catch can only because most of the time if it's a dedicated race car you're making bigger power you're going to be running e85 or some type of intermittent fuel that's not just pump gas and when you have 85 in there it promotes moisture you get moisture in your oil you're pumping that back into the system so you don't want to be draining that back into the car so in a situation like that i would do a catch can if you're in an extremely cold climate that sees below zero temperatures do a catch can over an aos because that aos return line can freeze from moisture buildup in there and then you're back feeding the oil back into the aos and you can blow up your motor that way wow okay so many follow-up questions <laughs> to that. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned, you know, if it's a dedicated track car or something like that, to not do uh, the AOS. Now, the now my question is, how does that affect, like, ethanol blends? If you're pumping... If you've got, no, like, an E30 or an E40 blend or Because that's what a lot of the VVs I mean, have it, right I now. I mean, it's not gonna, it's not going to mess up the blend. What you're doing is you may just be getting a little bit of that moisture. Because a lot of people, a lot of the times, you may have seen on Facebook, people will pop open their oil cap. They'll be like, what's this yellow stuff on the bottom of my oil uh-huh. cap? The yellow, frothy, pee-looking stuff. It's moisture. 
Your oil gets hot, creates water vapor, goes up, gets on the cap, mixes with the oil, turns into the yellow pea stuff. Same thing happens inside of your AOS where it's going to be pushing that back into the oil. But as for as far as ethanol content, obviously the higher the ethanol content, the more mm-hmm. prone it is to moisture because ethanol naturally will grab moisture more than pump gas will. Interesting. That is that's really interesting because like the some of the bigger tuning capabilities of the VB right now is of course E30, E40, E50 blends. Yeah. And um, I think there's a few catch cans out there that are a little expensive, but I think Parent is coming out with a AOS which is just maybe 50 or a hundred dollars more than a catch can. So I was thinking if for that price difference, why not just get an AOS? But yeah. So now let's say for street cars, which of the two would you recommend? If it's a street car, AOS, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about emptying the catch can. You don't have to worry about X, Y, or Z intervals. Leave it and forget it. Especially if you're using pump gas the majority of the time, even if you're using mm-hmm. like an E30, E40, E50 tune, you're probably still fine to use in AOS in that situation. Obviously, if you're running ethanol-based fuels, you should be changing your oil more frequently mm-hmm. anyways yeah. than you would be a pump gas. So it shouldn't become a major issue as long as you're doing the maintenance associated with it. Perfect. Oh, if you're driving a Subaru, you're already doing oil changes yeah. like at least every three weeks. <laughs> That's my Actually, it's really funny because my last uh, tuner talk that I did with Graham, one of the questions, I don't know how I even forgot to ask it the very first episode, was the, uh, the o- O-20 versus 5-30. That was, mm-hmm. that was a big thing, and he finally was like, look, just do 530 if you're doing, you know, if you're driving the car hard, 530. And um, I just got my oil change at the dealership just, like, maybe last week to 020. And the whole time, actually, somebody even made a comment. Is that what Subaru like, suggests for the, for the VBs is 020? For, yes, for gas mileage <laughs> purposes, yeah. I never, dude, it's like water. I refuse to use it. You know what I run in my EJs? What? 2050. Wow. I run 2050. In all the cars that see abuse, I use 2050. If it's like a street car, I'll use 1040. Okay. That even in my old, even in my BRZ with the FA24, it was all stock. I was running mm-hmm. 1040 in that car. I, I do not. The One of the reasons why Subaru uses 020 is fuel economy. Mm-hmm. A lower viscosity oil means the engine can move a little bit freer, a little bit easier, so you can get slightly better fuel economy out of it for a street car. Obviously, it doesn't have the same wear advantages as like a 1040, a 530, etc. would. But that's one of the big reasons why they use that 020. Um, I have a couple of buddies who work at Subaru, so I've had the opportunity to ask like Subaru of America and these uh-huh. type of things. So I was always curious. I was like, why are they using 020 in this stuff? I'm like, it's like water. Yeah. But because of the gas, and that's exactly what, what he mentioned as well. And after he said it, I was like, I got to go change it. I got to go change it because that's what I have. I've got 020 in it. So like this weekend, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it out because I do... If, if you see the chat, I like to do some spirited stuff from time to time. I've seen, I've seen it. I know what you. I know. What you. <laughs> Did I lose you? Uh, for oh, a minute, you. I think yeah. you're back. I got you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do things that uh, five thirty probably it, it, it needs some five thirty in it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good, because I, I'm going to be putting an AOS together this weekend, and I've never done it before, but I, I. After opening that box and seeing all the parts and going through the instructions, I I kind of got that deer in the headlights moment. Um, but that's that's the it's gonna be the biggest thing. I I've promise done so it's far. not it's not that bad. Okay, all right, and hey, and me when I make videos about installing, you see all of it. Sometimes I don't even edit. I'm like, look, if it took me three hours, you're gonna watch three hours of installations because you might run into the same yep. problems. Like I, it's funny because I watch other people do installations, then I go do them. And I'm amazed. I'm like, how did they not run into this problem? Like, I just ran into three different problems. They skip past it. They yeah. always edit it all out. I'm like, just, I want to see where you messed up. Yeah, because if you if I do the same thing and I go back and watch the video and it didn't happen to them, what do I do now? Yeah. You know, and it's funny because I just installed a, a front arrow lip. Uh, and it's the easiest thing in the world. All you do, you just screw it up. But I ran into, like, two very specific issues. And I haven't seen anybody talk about it. So I was like... Is it me? Am I the problem? <laughs> sometimes I think that I, sometimes I think I am the problem because I'll I'll cause when I was doing the shifter stop, there were you know I have very clumsy hands. I have big long fingers, yeah. very clumsy, and they were like, okay, this tiny little washer, put this here, and I was like, oh man, this is it. I'm gonna drop this. I just know I'm gonna drop this. You know. So sometimes I it happens you know, to all of us. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this this next one I'm very very interested in because. I think I may need one soon, is choosing, how do you go about choosing the right clutch? 
So obviously, if if you're not having a clutch problem, don't create a clutch problem. Don't go out and just swap mm-hmm. clutches because you want a different clutch. If you are looking into a clutch, you obviously are either making more torque because that's how clutches are rated. They're not rated in horsepower. They're rated in torque, which some people get confused on. That's totally all right. They're rated in torque ratings. Um, some of them are measured uh, like wheel torque. Some of them are measured at the crank. So when you're looking at clutches, make sure that that measurement is calculated properly, whether it's measuring it at the crank or at the wheels, because that's about a 20% difference in um, in power. But if if it's a street car, always get a sprung clutch. Do not get an unsprung clutch. You're going to hate driving the car. Yeah, It's absolutely terrible. If you've never seen a, a clutch disc, there's little springs in there, which help. I'm trying to, in the simplest of terms, it makes the car way more comfortable yeah. to drive and it gets it more to an OEM pedal feel versus an unsprung clutch. An unsprung clutch, you're going to push the clutch pedal in and it's either, it's going to on off switch. That's uh-huh. it. You're not going to have any engagement period. It's literally either going to be on or off. Um, so if it's a street car, get something sprung, get something that's rated to the torque rating for which you're going to be making or which you plan on making. Uh, if you don't know how much power you're going to be making, obviously talk to your tuner, be like, all right, this is the build list I'm doing. What clutch would you recommend for how much, however many torques you think we're going to be making? Yeah. If it's a dedicated race car, um, multi-disc clutches is what I recommend for people. Um, in the hatch, I have the ACT Mod Twin, which is probably my favorite clutch. I have multi-disc clutch I've ever used. It feels OEM and it's a twin disc. It holds, I think it's like 850 foot pounds of torque at the wheels. It's honestly my favorite clutch. It's a little bit pricey at like $1,600. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're looking for somewhat good longevity, reliability, and comfort out of a clutch, and it's more of a, a race car that you're using a lot more often, obviously a multi-disc clutch is going to be a little bit better. They are more expensive than a single disc clutch. So if you're balling on a budget, you're going to mm-hmm. be probably looking at a single disc clutch rather than those multi-discs. But if you can wait a couple more weeks or another month until you get paid again, get the multi-disc over the single discs mm-hmm. for, for those cars. But for like a general street car, the clutch that I recommend people most is the ACT HDSS. It's a good feeling clutch, holds a decent amount of torque for what most people are going to be doing for a standard street car. Um, and they're rather inexpensive. Normally I'd say use an OEM flywheel. Don't use a lightweight flywheel unless you really want to. I have never noticed a massive difference between a lightweight and an OEM flywheel. Plus the rotational mass from an OEM flywheel is a little bit nicer. Uh-huh. Um, and the, they're, they're a comfortable clutch. I like them. Interesting. Because I was recently, everything that I've been doing, uh, I've been thinking, oh, maybe I should at least start putting money away. And I was watching mm-hmm. your clutch videos just the other day, more so like to learn if I want to do it myself. Because I have a buddy who I probably am going to do it with. He's changed, like, I think so far, the clutch of every model Subaru up to up to uh, an FA most recently. So he said it probably is going to be the same thing underneath for the VB as well. Do you have a two post lift? Or does he have a two post lift? Oh, it's going to be one of those, put it on jack stands. Pull the engine. Game. Oh, I know. I saw engine. that. I saw that. And I'm like, I don't I don't know if we can pull the engine. <laughs> yeah, That's if you have an engine hoist, pull the engine. Dude, it's so much easier to change a clutch pulling the engine than it is taking the transmission out. So every yeah. time we have to deal with it, we always pull the engines. If you have a two-post lift and an actual transmission jack, it's not uh-huh. bad to do it by taking out the transmission. If you don't have that, pull the engine. That would be a learning experience too, because I, that's exactly what you said in your video too. And I, and I was wondering, I was like, man, the engine's out and they're going to do it this way. And I was like, okay, I don't know. This seems like it's making it harder <laughs> for me. Dude, it's, it's awful having to do it with taking the transmission out. We had to do it twice recently mm-hmm. when we had to take the six speed out of the WRX because we couldn't go into reverse. So obviously we had to repair the six speed and then get it back up in and putting that transmission in from underneath of the car was it took us longer to put a transmission in from the bottom of the car and get everything else hooked up than it took us to pull the engine out, replace the clutch, and put it back in and get it going again. Oh, man. <laughs> that, okay. I can see that. And I did see it, but, oof, man, you're asking a lot. You're asking a lot from me. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. If it's your first time doing it, it's not, it's not terrible. Just label uh, everything. Yeah. That's the I biggest know, oh, thing. Yeah. Painter's tape. Mm-hmm. One one two two. That way, you know everything connects back up and whatnot. Yep, that's thankfully that's something I, in from IT, especially uh, routing cable and uh, setting up uh, patch panels. That's always labeled. Last thing you want to do mm-hmm. is you're like, all right, plug up the CEO's computer, and like the refrigerator down the hall gets a network connection. You're like, well, what the hell yep. happened? Um, that's oh, so, okay. This one thing I want to know about clutches. So I understand that the rating is important. Now, how close to the rated? So like you have a clutch rating, but then you have whatever your car is rated. How close do they need to be? Or is there... What do you mean, so what like, do you mean let's by say how your, your car rated? makes uh, 450 torque? 
and you okay. buy this clutch that's like 475 is that extra do you should there be like an extra buffer for torque so if you're going off of just the manufacturer ratings and what you think your car is going to be making try to leave a 15 to 20 percent buffer what most manufacturers do is they'll they'll include a buffer into that clutch already and obviously they'll they'll advertise it lower than what it actually will hold so but if you're looking at just ratings alone try to get like a 10 to 15 percent rating in between where the clutch is and then where your car is obviously with the clutch being rated for more than what the car is making okay that's what i i was curious about that because you see that they're like 450 300 800 so i'm like well does it you know how far can i go like you know like you said yeah. you want to just throw like his 800 dollar, you know 800 pound foot torque clutch mm -hmm. in your stock car so that's that was that's a me question that's because i yeah. need to learn more about that um, so that's pretty much that's all I ha kind of had. I actually usually what I do for Tuner Talk is I go through the comments from the last Tuner Talk, and and this time apparently apparently my community is completely knowledgeable about everything now because I asked for more questions and everybody's like, Beautiful. I'm good, I'm I'm good. This this is a good video. Thank you. We'll wait for next cool. time. I'm like, uh, all right. Do you not have any questions. So um, the so this is a couple of things for me. This is something I've been asking people, and I have a feeling I already kind of know the answer to this. When you looked at the new VB, mm -hmm. you, what do you prefer? Paint mash VB or the natural honeycomb that it comes in? It depends. If it is... So, I really like Aeroflow Dynamics cars, what mm -hmm. they've done with the flares. I prefer the paint matched on most of them. If the car is OEM black, I think the unpainted flares look fine. Because <laughs> you can't if see them. <laughs> if it's gray, they also look fine. If it's uh -huh. white, you can go either way. If it's uh, literally any other color, they need to be painted. And if it's orange, just paint the whole car. If it's orange, wrap it, paint it, change the whole color. <laughs> I just right. do, it's just the orange, man. I can't do it. When I saw the orange, I was actually most... It was just so funny because, like, you mentioned this. that When I saw that it was coming out in orange, I was more excited because... You know, when you think of, like, a sports car, you think bright, flashy, slap it in yeah. your face colors. And, like... What better color than orange? But like the orange was subjective because the cross track came in orange and everybody's like, mm -hmm. well, now it literally looks like a cross track. So it's, it's so funny. The orange keeps coming up. That's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I love orange juice. So everything else, orange, I'm fine with it. That's uh, all right. So out of everything that we've talked about, let's say there is a prospective Subaru owner, somebody who has been on the fence and maybe has never owned one before. Maybe this is even like their first performance car that they're looking at to buy. Do you have any words of wisdom or inspiration to give this, this possible new Subaru owner? I mean, don't let, don't let the negatives of the internet sway you away from the car. They're, they're honestly my favorite cars, which is why I've bought 40 plus of them at this point. There's a reason I keep buying them, especially the STIs. If you're looking at a STI, a VBWX, a VAWRX, they all have their pros and cons. No one car is better than any of the others, in my opinion, because they're all going to be, they're different cars. None, none of them are equal. So don't let the negative woes of the internet get to you, of people saying they're going to blow up, they're going to do X, Y, or Z. Take the time to do the research of the platform you're buying. Take the time to learn. If you're buying it used, obviously go through there and do all the maintenance that it needs. If you don't have a record of it, do it anyways. Uh, spark plugs aren't as bad as people make it out to seem, except on DRZs and FRSs, then they are actually are terrible. Um, enjoy the car, learn the car before you start going ham, modifying everything on it, drive it, learn the car a little bit more, know what you need to do, what you don't need to do necessarily, and maybe that money could be spent better in other areas. Take care of all the reliability mods. I've got like five or six videos on them mm -hmm. at this point for reliability mods that can be transferred from... FA20s, FA24s, EJs, EGs, you name it. it. Goes across the board, but enjoy the car and don't let the don't let the negative woes of the internet get to you. That is nothing more important could be said about Subarus in general. Um, anyway, that was I guys, I hope you enjoyed this. This has been such a great uh, learning experience for me. I again, I'm very thankful Tanner, thank you so much for coming down uh, yeah. taking time to come down to the channel and thanks for uh, having me oh yeah please <laughs> is it has been great i i had a hard time not like just fangirling this whole time because <laughs> again like i said i've watched your videos for so long and they've made an actual like practical impact on the way that i drive my car or the way that i think about my subaru uh, because like you said about these word of inspiration i was i was that prospective 
uh, yeah. guy. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, next time for this Tuner Talk, if you have any questions, please make sure to drop them down uh, in the comments below. And we'll try to get them in the next Tuner Talk. Anyway, we'll see you Subscribe guys to his channel, too. Uh, yes. Do oh, it. there you go. That's, that's all I needed. <laughs> Perfect. See you guys.